Thus, Baltimore entered their first game against the 49ers with Johnny Unitas facing the opponent's sideline, not its goal line, while Earl Morrow faced the stiffest test of his career, a test which he nearly failed when on the third play of the game, his pass was intercepted and run in for a touchdown. But Earl Morrow then passed his test against his former teammates. It was revenge for Morrow and victory for the Colts. Revenge and victory, Baltimore's theme for 1968. Much of the current success of the Baltimore Colts can also be attributed to shrewd trading. An 11th hour deal on the eve of the season brought Baltimore a venerable quarterback named Earl Morrill, number 15. For the second week in a row, Morrill replaced the ailing John Unitas and guided Baltimore to a victory over the Atlanta Falcons. Morrill directed one touchdown pass to tight end John Mackey, number 88. But more often than not, he aimed his throws at veteran Jimmy Orr, number 28. After a year's absence, Orr is returned to the game, and although the layoff might have robbed him of his speed, he nonetheless pulled in five passes, totaling 160 yards. Marlon Orr teamed with Tom Matty in the week's most unusual maneuver, a double lateral pass play that ended in a 46-yard touchdown reception by Orr. The Falcons' offense was also bolstered by a trade. Bob Long, number 80, the sprint and catch expert formerly of the Green Bay Packers, reeled off a 71-yard touchdown. Long score brought the Falcons to within a touchdown of the Colts, but Baltimore held on to win 28-20. In their second game, it took a flea flicker from Marl to Orr, one of three scoring passes, to help beat the stubborn Atlanta Falcons 28-20. In Pittsburgh, the Colts' defense tied an NFL record when Roy Hilton, Charlie Stoops, and Bobby Boyd ran back three interceptions for touchdowns in a 41-7 rout. It was the kind of day that made Larry Rakestraw, surviving member of the Bears' trio of quarterbacks, wish that he had taken a course in evasion tactics as the pressing Colt defense allowed the Bears only 80 yards through the air. The Colt defense made only two mistakes all day. They were costly, but not fatal. The first was quarterback Virgil Carter's long pass to number 45, Dick Gordon. The second error came as Gail Sayers, apparently trapped, broke up the right sideline and burned 59 yards for the Bears' lone score. Bear opponents have come to expect errors of this type. But then Colt quarterback Earl Marl took charge. After passing to Willie Richardson for one touchdown, he came right back to hit tight end John Mackey twice for 79 yards and a touchdown. The once stingy Dooley defense continued its new image as a charitable organization by giving 306 yards to the Baltimore air attack. And accepting one of the many large donations, Marl connected with number 28, Jimmy Orr, for 44 yards and six points. The Colts took a 21-7 halftime lead.
In the second half, the Bears continued to have their troubles as Morrow repeatedly threw for long yardage. On the last scoring play of the game, he connected with Jimmy Orr again for 66 yards and a touchdown. There just weren't enough fingers in the Dooley defense to plug all the holes in the dike, and the Colts won easily 28-7. Baltimore's fourth straight win came over the Bears, even though Gale Sayers put the Colts behind early with this 60-yard scoring gallop. But that was all Sayers and the Bears would get. The Colts gained 150 yards rushing against a rugged defense, and Morrow threw for four touchdowns in a 28-7 victory. Opening kickoff was the backbreaker in the Colts' second victory over the 49ers, 42-14. Preston Pearson, who never played college football, cantered 97 yards to a touchdown. Baltimore returned home undefeated to play the Cleveland Browns, and two weeks ahead lay a showdown with its arch rival, the Los Angeles Rams. In their long and memorable football history, the Baltimore Colts have produced a wealth of talent. Donovan, Mutchler, Marchetti, and Parker were just a few of the many ex-Colts honored at today's game in Baltimore. The honored Colts of the past and their counterparts on today's team have one thing in common. No Baltimore team has ever beaten the Cleveland Browns in Baltimore. Finicky, he was the man that caused the fumble with a blindside shot at Morrow, giving Cleveland the ball on the Colts 37. Nelson again went for a down and out pattern to Warfield and due to loose coverage by Lenny Lyles, this play worked well all day. He is valuable not only as a runner, but in other ways. And we see why on the next play, as Green executed a magnificent fake which allowed Nelson to flip a pass to Kelly for the touchdown. Cleveland led 7-0 near the end of the quarter. Don Shula has premised his whole attack on the quick strike. And like Unitas, Earl Marl has been able to deliver it in every game. On the last play, it was a strike to reliable Jimmy Orr, number 28, who had beaten Ben Davis to the inside and hung onto the ball despite a jolt by safety Mike Howell. But the next quick strike was not through the air. It was provided by Tom Matty, the Colts' versatile setback, who can do it all, and does it with a style which, like the Cowboys' Dan Reeves, doesn't command headlines, but without which the Colts would not be a consistent winner. Matty's brilliant touchdown run was a combination of moves, speed, and strength. True to form, the quick-striking Colts were now back in the game with a score tied at seven. and a Kelly slant put the ball on the eight with 50 seconds left. Ernie Green used as a decoy on the Browns' first score, here became a receiver. Green led the team in receiving last year. Then on second and goal from the five, Paul Warfield again beat number 43, Lenny Lyles, to the outside, and a perfectly thrown pass by Nelson produced six more points. Don Cockroft, the Browns' new place kicker, converted, and it was now 14 to seven, with only seconds left in the half. Like his famous substitute, Earl Marl is adept at beating the clock, and almost did. He foiled Cleveland's prevent defense by hitting Matty with a medium range pass just over the linebacker. But his mistake, one of the few he has made all year, was to go for the bomb. Ben Davis, number 28, looked like a Colts receiver as he took the pass on the run, 
and ran the clock out with this interception. A spirited defense, a solid quarterback, and a super runner had given Cleveland a surprising halftime lead, 14 to 7. The second half opened with a kickoff into the shadows to rookie Terry Cole from Indiana. Cole, who was the 247th man chosen in the draft, almost went all the way. But Cole hopes of having one of their patented rallies behind their new quarterback by the name of Unitas were ended immediately as number 34, Mike Howell, picked off this batted ball. It was to be the Browns, not the Colts, who would score. As the Colts bunched for the run, number 87, Epi Barney, flanked wide to the right. And Nelson found him streaking across the end zone for the touchdown. Barney has replaced the Browns' fine flanker, Gary Collins. And David Lee punted from deep in his own territory. But Ben Davis botched the punt reception. One of three he misplayed today, and the Colts had the break they needed so badly. Unitas went to the air and received another Cleveland gift when number 24, Ernie Kellerman, was guilty of interference. Then Unitas dumped a pass to number 45, fullback Jerry Hill, who made a 12-yard gain of it. This play, seen again from another angle, is significant because, incredible as it may seem, it was the only pass Unitas would complete all day in a dozen attempts. A draw to Hill worked. But Baltimore needed the pass, and Unitas, obviously off on his timing with his receivers, couldn't give it to them. The Colts, who badly wanted a touchdown, had to settle for this Lou Michaels field goal, which brought the score to 21-10. When the ball bounced off the foot of number 27, Carl Ward, and kicker Michaels recovered on the Browns' 29. Don Shula is a coach who espouses a pounce philosophy of play, which says that every team receives a few breaks during a game, and the team that is able to take instant advantage of these breaks will win. This was the second such opportunity for the Colts, but again it was not to be, as the young Cleveland defense, which has four men at new positions, made the kind of play reserved for winning football teams. On a vital third down possession pass, Unitas tried to hit Orr for the first down, but his arm betrayed him once more. Another look shows that veteran Orr just missed a fingertip grab of the ball. But the touchdown drive was over. A Michaels field goal made the score 21-13. The first time Baltimore got the ball in the final quarter, disaster struck again. Unitas tried to hit Jimmy Orr, but the ball bounced out of his hands and into those of Brown's middle linebacker, number 56, Bob Matheson, who returned to the Colt Four. Matheson, who was Cleveland's number one draft pick a year ago, is one of the key men in the Browns' young rebuilt defense. Needed one play by the fantastic Kelly to take the ball in, 
and move the game further away from the Colts' reach. The kick was blocked, but the score was now 27 to 13. In the next play, a good rush by defensive tackle Johnson, an orange helmet, and number 80, Bill Glass, combined for the third interception of Unitas. Warfield thought he had the touchdown. But the official ruled that both feet weren't in when he made the catch. And Cockroft was called upon for three points and a 30 to 13 margin. Earl Morrow was quarterback now in place of the beleaguered Unitas, and he got immediate results to Tom Matty down the left side. Playing the Browns is always something special for Mr. Matty, who was born in Cleveland, attended Ohio State, and usually makes the Browns painfully aware that he's in the game. Moving well now behind their second string quarterback, Baltimore with tight end Mackey went into Cleveland territory determined to quell the apparent upset. But once again, Cleveland got excellent pass coverage as number 28, Ben Davis, blanketed Orr in the end zone. Bill Glass, number 80, captured Morrow from behind to temporarily delay the Colts' quest to reduce the margin against them. But on the next play, Morrow found Richardson near the uprights to bring the Colts within 10 points. The clock ran out, and so did Baltimore's winning streak, 30 to 20. But for Leroy Kelly and the Cleveland Browns, it was an important step toward repeating as winner in the Century Division. The Browns had dealt Baltimore a defeat. Now a victory over the Rams would not only be revenge, but a necessity. The Colts won 24-10 and won so convincingly that the Rams gained little over 100 total yards and Gabriel was unmercifully dumped five times by a defense that played with a controlled fury at times frightening to watch. In retrospect, this became Baltimore's biggest game of the year since a rematch would turn out to be meaningless. More importantly, it gave them an emotional lift that helped them stampede through the rest of the season. Until today, George Allen and the Los Angeles Rams had been on the run, running fast, running hard, and running away from their competition in the rest of the NFL. A swarthy Hollywood type by the name of Roman Gabriel had led the Rams through 14 straight regular season victories. But the key to their success rests with their defense, and a group known affectionately as the Fearsome Foursome. Most, if not all, of the NFL's defensive medals have already been pinned on their chests. Chest, which, strange as it may seem, have attracted more followers than did a young lady's on Wall Street not so long ago. But the Baltimore Colts were doing some running of their own, and they were running for their football lives. Having suffered their first defeat of the season last week, the Colts had to beat the undefeated Rams today to stay in contention, and they would have to do it with the same tools that had put the Rams on top. I'm Jack Whitaker, and this is the NFL Game of the Week. Of categories, the Rams are also the best at blocking punts. And this one by Jack Pardee set up the first break of the game. Tony Guillory was the man who recovered. Guillory is best known for blocking a punt in the last seconds to help the Rams gain victory over the Packers last year. Baltimore's line play forced the Rams to settle for a field goal and an early 3-0 lead. Their third try would prove no more fruitful than the first two. Linebacker Mike Curtis turned in a sweep for a seven-yard loss. Curtis's brilliant defensive play deserves another look from his own vantage point. Watch number 32, one of today's defensive heroes, as he fought off two blocks and then roped halfback Dick Bass to the ground.
The Rams have their fearsome foursome, but the Colts have their Smith brothers, Billy Ray and Bubba. And here Bubba made a play which would certainly call for a prescription from their namesakes to help the Rams. But the only kind of prescription good for the Rams today may have been bed rest. Their line was weak, Gabriel was off, and once again the Colts took over. Coach Don Shula believes in the big play theory of offensive football. Morrill and Tom Matty must have listened well because they have provided him with such moments all season long. Here, a weaving 50-yard run off a swing pass from the NFL's first all-pro substitute quarterback gave the Colts their first golden opportunity, one yard short of six points. From the one, Jerry Hill took a dive, but appeared to be stopped. However, on the replay, Hill just did barely make it in for the touchdown. Colt six, Rams three, as a deacon named Jones blocked the conversion. Shula's quick strike theory was nowhere more evident than in today's game, as the Colts scored three times within five minutes. But it was their defense which provided them with the quick strikes. The first came on this fumble by Willie Ellison that bounced into the hands of several Colts defenders. Number 76, Fred Miller, finally came up with the ball, and Miller, another defensive standout in today's game, rumbled down to the Rams' four-yard line. Tom Matty tried the Rams' right side, but met head-on with number 32 linebacker Jack Pardee, whose heroics are usually unnoticed in the acclaim given to his front line. Then Marl executed a perfect play-action fake to Matty, received a key block on Deacon Jones by number 71 Dan Sullivan, and rolled around right end for the touchdown. Their second in little over two minutes. Baltimore now led 13-3 and had scored more points in one quarter than the Rams usually allow in an entire game. And with each series, they had yet to achieve a first down, and their scorecard read like an Arthur Murray dance course. One, two, three, kick. An isolated view of quarterback Gabriel on this incompleted pass was symbolic of the Rams' backward momentum. When Gabriel wasn't being hounded by the Smith brothers and company, his passes were off target and allowed the Colts' fine safeties to play the ball, as number 20 Jerry Logan did on this interception, which helped set up yet another Baltimore score. On a replay of the theft, we see that the ball actually tipped off a Ram receiver, number 87, Billy Truax, who then made the tackle on Logan. Then the Georgia Peach, Jimmy Orr, slipped by his man on a post pattern as he had done in nearly every game. And Morrow, who leads the league in yards passing, fired a perfect throw into Orr's hand for the touchdown, Earl's 14th of the season. Colts 20, Rams 3 held Los Angeles to an amazing three first downs, 27 yards rushing, and an incredible zero net yards passing, 
due to the four times Gabriel was thrown attempting to pass. The game had now been renamed Assault on a Roman, a title for the Rams to take back to Hollywood with them. Unable to capitalize on any break, they failed to score a touchdown after the blocked punt early in the game, and here a high-low tackle by Miller and Smith caused Gabriel to lose the ball and the opportunistic Colts recovered on the Rams 46. Jerry Hill bulled his way for six yards on two successive carries. Then on third and four, Morrow faked a short pass and went for the bomb to tight end John Mackey. The pass was underthrown, but interference was called and the Rams had made another seemingly costly mistake. Matty knifed up the middle for three as Morrow was setting up the Rams for an outside move. The move was to be a quick out by Jimmy Orr. He had Irv Cross beat, but Marl's throw was wide. Matty then took a swing pass and looked like he would score. But a jarring jolt by Ron Smith caused a fumble and Baltimore was stopped three yards short. The Rams had to go into the locker room with only three points. They seemed to be anxious to get there as they had been humiliated for 30 minutes and trailed Baltimore 20 to three. The Baltimore defense quickly reasserted itself, however, when linebacker Ron Porter forced Bass to fumble on another screen. And though he recovered it himself, the Ram drive stalled. Steady Tom Matty, who had another fine day, accepted the escort offered him by number 62, guard Glenn Ressler, for an eight-yard pickup. And the Baltimore offense was on its way again. Quarterback Marl hit a jumping Willie Richardson near the line for a first down. Then went to number 84, rookie tight end Tom Mitchell, who was all alone for a 44-yard touchdown that all but shut the door on Los Angeles. On the play, the Colts employed a Don Shula innovation, that of using two tight ends in the lineup at the same time, and the confused Los Angeles secondary couldn't cope with them both. Mitchell is one of only a handful of former AFL players in the NFL. The Colts now enjoyed a commanding 27-3 lead. Jack Snow made his solitary catch of the afternoon and paid for it, but Los Angeles had their fifth first down off this drive and the ball on Baltimore's two-yard line. After a running play failed, Gabriel made a nice fake and hit Casey in his favorite spot, the left corner of the end zone for the touchdown. Another look at the scoring play shows the fake to the setback held up the defense long enough to allow Gabriel to get off the toss and Casey to get several steps on number 20, Jerry Logan, where he made a graceful one-hand snare of the ball and pulled it in for six points. It brought the score to 27-10 at the conclusion of the third quarter. As time ran out, the Colts went to the air in a futile attempt to get another score, despite the certainty of their victory. There was a valid reason for this. The two teams play again in Los Angeles, and in case of a tie, the Rams must win by more than 17 points to take the division title. In beating the Rams, Don Shula's Colts had ended at 14 games, the third longest winning streak in NFL history, setting up the strong possibility of a repeat of last year, when these two powerful football teams carried their fight for the Coastal Division title to the final game of the regular season. In New York, the Giants became the Colts' first shutout victim since 1964, as they stifled Fran Tarkenton's razzle-dazzle and won 26-0.
The Colts handled the Giants easily, 26 to nothing, as Earl Morrill, playing against his ex-teammates, passed for one touchdown to Willie Richardson, number 87. And one to Jimmy Orr, number 28. The shutout marked the first time in five years that the Giants had failed to score. In Detroit, the Colts won 27-10 as the defense got to Bill Munson four times and Earl Morrill threw for 250 yards to complete a sweep of all of the teams he formerly played with. The Detroit Lions offensive team had not scored a touchdown in 15 quarters, not since 1.30 p.m. on October the 20th. Then in the fourth quarter against Baltimore last Sunday, Bill Munson threw to Billy Gambrell and the string was finally broken. But in spite of the heroics of the little ex-Cardinal flanker, the Lions, for the rest of the day, were always stopped short by the powerful Colts and their strong bench. Time and again on crucial third down plays, a Baltimore defender would break through, and despite Munson's attempts to hold him off, he could not. Number 74, Billy Ray Smith, and number 76, Fred Miller. Both broke through to make important third down tackles, sometimes with a flurry. As for the Colts' offense, they really didn't need much. Waiting two yards behind his goal line was Preston Pearson, the first Colt to touch the ball. Pearson, an ex-basketball player from Illinois, leads the league in returning kickoffs and has now made the two longest plays of the NFL season. For the first time this year, Earl Morrow did not throw a touchdown pass, but he did throw 10 non-scoring passes which were carried for substantial gains by such stalwarts as number 88. John Mackey. While Mackey runs through people, 10-year veteran Jimmy Orr somehow gets by people, as he did last Sunday for 160 total yards. In just five plays, Orr accounted for nearly half of Baltimore's total offensive yardage. While Orr never scored, such details were efficiently handled by the runners. Number 41, Tom Matty put the game out of Detroit's reach. The Colts, behind Earl Morrill, continued to play like champions, 27 to 10. A 27-0 win over St. Louis gave the Colts their second shutout in three weeks, with five interceptions being the key to victory. Baltimore led St. Louis 7-0 with time running out in the first half. Jim Hart threw. Jackie Smith raced under the ball in the end zone. This was as close as St. Louis could come all day to scoring a point against the Colts' league-leading defense. The game had begun on an encouraging note for St. Louis, as Willis Crenshaw, number 33, on the Cardinals' first play from scrimmage, took a Jim Hart screen pass for a 22-yard gain. From then on, Baltimore, whose defense has grudgingly allowed only 11 points per game, seemed to ambush every effort by Crenshaw and the Cardinals. 
The quick opener was closed quickly by the Colt linebackers. Number 78, Bubba Smith, was not fooled by the Cardinal draw play. The Cardinals' plight grew more hopeless as the game wore on. 12-year veteran Ordell Bracey, number 81, found a rather embarrassing but effective way to mess up Jim Hart's passing. Number 74, 10-year veteran Billy Ray Smith, is still one of the game's best pass rushers. So harried was Hart, he could complete only 17 of his 48 passes and five were run right back at him. Two by number 40, nine-year veteran Bob Boyd, and two others by 11-year veteran Lenny Lyles. Sometimes it seemed as if half the Baltimore defenders were fighting their own private war for the ball. Colt linebacker Mike Curtis, number 32, showed several times that he is one of the modern school of defenders who knows how to use his head. The left knee of number 27, Roy Shivers, was stiff and sore on Monday morning. For Mike Curtis, the ache was just as persistent. Only the location was different. Shutting out St. Louis for the first time in 91 games was wonderful fun. But leading the NFL in hard-headed defense does have its drawbacks. To win nine of 10 games requires some offense too. Earl Morrill threw to a variety of receivers including relatively small Jimmy Orr, number 28, and relatively large John Mackey, number 88. He helped the Colts to a day's average of seven yards per offensive play. Mackey has a well-earned reputation of being one of the hardest men in football to defend against, catching or running. When Mackey builds up the head of steam on an end around, it is a brave man who places himself in his path. For the long ball, this week Morrill went to Willie Richardson, whose speed must have surprised some Cardinals. Richardson covered 79 yards on a first quarter post pattern for the Colts' first score of the day. In the third period, he covered 29 more on a corner pattern for the Colts' second touchdown. A good fake to number 34, Terry Cole, and a short flip to number 41, Tom Matty, closed out a second shutout victory in the increasingly amazing story of the 1968 Baltimore Colts. Against the tough Minnesota Vikings, Morrill threw for three first-half scores, but the defense was again the difference as they reached the quarterback five times and hung on in the second half to preserve a 21-9 victory. Today was a special day in Baltimore. Colt fans were honoring one of their all-time greats, Lenny Moore. Perhaps no one will ever be able to match the flying feet of number 24, but herein lies one of the secrets of the Colt's success. Although unable really to replace a Lenny Moore, a Gino Marchetti, a Raymond Burry, or most recently a John Unitas, the heirs to their positions have been instrumental in keeping Baltimore at the top. Today, these men would do it again, play a key role against the Minnesota Vikings. I'm Jack Whitaker, and this is the NFL Game of the Week. 
three plays later, he almost shocked the stadium. His bomb was perfectly thrown, but was dropped by flanker Tom Hall, only fingers away from a touchdown. And the Vikings had a punt on their first series. Super sub Earl Morrow would try to weave his magic for the 10th time in 11 games. Today, his plan would be to work on the left side of the Viking secondary by using his flanker, number 87, Willie Richardson, on short, medium, and long patterns. He would also try to run on the Vikings' front line, something few teams have been able to do this season. After rookie Terry Cole got six, Carl Eller and Jim Marshall stacked him up on third down, and the drive was shut out as a missed field goal followed, and Minnesota took over. On second and one, Cap tried some deception and went for the bomb. His idea was good, but his execution was not. Rick Volk picked off his pass, and Baltimore now had its second chance with the ball. Terry Cole, number 34, is another graphic illustration of Coach Don Shula's depth. Cole is filling in for Jerry Hill, and is almost equal in ability. One man who has no equal is the Colts super tight end, John Mackey, number 88. Big, strong, and fast, Mackey's reception brought the ball to the 45. Morrow used only three plays to move the ball 87 yards. The third was this bomb to Willie Richardson, perfectly led by Morrow's high, deep pass. First and ten on the three. From the one, Terry Cole's dive seemed to be stopped. But on the replay, we can see that the referee did signal a touchdown and a 7-0 Baltimore lead. The Vikings were again past midfield, but again would be unable to salvage even a field goal. Number 78, Bubba Smith, wrapped up cap for a seven-yard loss. Then on second and 17, cap faked long and completed a short one. But to the Colts, Don Shinnick. Baltimore's second interception protected a 7-0 first quarter lead. The Colt defense has been more impressive than even Don Shula could have imagined. Led by Billy Ray and Bubba Smith, Fred Miller, Ordell Bracey, and a set of youthful linebackers, Baltimore's defense has rivaled the Rams as the NFL's number one unit and has given its explosive offense an unusual number of opportunities. Number 41, Tom Matty. But like his injured predecessor, Earl Morrill's bag is the forward pass, and Willie Richardson's bag is catching it. Richardson's first touchdown of the game and his fifth catch of the half, good for 132 yards, gave the Colts a 14 to nothing lead. Willie is in his second season as a starter and is making a bid for a second straight All-Pro nomination. He, Jimmy Orr, John Mackey, have provided Unitas and now Morrow with one of the best sets of receivers in the game. Minnesota has a rookie return specialist named Bob Bryant, number 20, and he almost broke the ensuing kickoff before being knocked to the ground by the Colts' own return man, Preston Pearson. Bubba Smith met Bill Brown with a forearm shot heard round the stadium and pushed the Vikings backward and out of field goal range. On the last play, three of the front four bullied their way through to the air. His clutch receiver, Willie Richardson, made a great catch to stay in bounds at the Viking 42, 
with two minutes left in the half. Not only was Morrow getting superb protection, but his line was now opening alleys for his setbacks. First Tom Matty around the right side, then Terry Cole on a swing pass in the middle, and Baltimore was on the 18, save to prevent six more points. The Colts had inserted two tight ends for the running game, but on second and 10, crossed up the Vikings by sending one of them, number 84, Tom Mitchell, straight down the middle into the end zone. The result? Passes to Gene Washington and Jim Lindsay brought the ball to the Colts 44, and this time he tried to ensure field goal range by running Brown into the middle of the field to set up a 36-yard attempt by Fred Cox. The kick was good, but as the half ended, a superior defense and an unstoppable combination had put the Colts into a commanding 21-3 lead to catch him from behind. Then the Viking defense forced the first break of the half. Lonnie Warwick tipped Morrow's pass, and number 46, Ursel McBee, picked it off and returned it, showing fine running form, 36 yards upfield. Minnesota now had the ball in excellent scoring position on the Baltimore 26-yard line, but it didn't take long to realize Baltimore's defense was still in the game. Clint Jones was introduced to Dennis Gawbats, five other friends, and a two-yard loss. Jim Lindsay, after taking a circle pass, ran into the same ubiquitous gentleman and barely recouped the previous loss. Gawbats has less success stopping field goals than runners, so Fred Cox was able to put one through the uprights from 37 yards out, but it was almost intercepted by veteran Ed Chiracca. Morrow then had the fleet Willie Richardson isolated on linebacker Winston, and the flanker executed the sideline hop for an 18-yard gain and a first down. Sandusky. Cole came right back with the same play, with the same results, a six-yard pickup. Then a double fake and an end around by huge John Mackey, a former Syracuse University fullback, went for 14 yards. It was the Morrow Mackey combination again, and another chance for number 88 to display good running form. Cole, who has been a big boost to the Colts, accepted a hole given by his blocker Dan Sullivan and got half a dozen just short of the first down. With inches to go and a Viking defense bunch for the run, Morrow, looking like a replica of his famed predecessor, Unitas, heaved the bomb goalward, but it was barely underthrown. It was a good call and the pass narrowly missed, but it was here that a small, almost unperceptible change took place in the game. Despite the fact that Morrow got the first down on a quarterback sneak, the momentum had subtly transferred from the Colts to the Vikings. Terry Cole took a swing pass, but despite a stiff arm, safety Paul Krause pulled him down after a minimum gain. Cole followed Tom Matty's interference through left guard for a five-yard addition. Then on a three-and-two situation, Marl passed to Jimmy Orr at his goal line and hit Ed Sherrockman instead for the second Minnesota interception of the quarter. Kinnear man John Beasley for a first down. As if to remind their former teammate that this was the Colts defense he was taking apart, 12-year veteran Ordell Bracey, number 81, ran Quazzo into the ground. The Baltimore front four penetrated again, however, and Quazzo lost the ball in attempting to avoid it. Luckily, his center, Mick Tinglehoff, recovered for a loss of six. After a run failed, Quazzo continued his exploitation of the Baltimore secondary, by passing to Washington for a 12-yard completion on third down long yardage. But it was short of a first down, and Cox kicked his third field goal nine seconds into the fourth quarter. The margin had been further reduced, 21-9. Which has given up only 13 touchdowns in 11 games, proved its greatness by throwing the powerful Brown back on two successive plays 
and saving the score. The Colts had regained the momentum and preserved their glittering defensive record. Terry Cole, the game's leading rusher, fought his way out of his end zone to the 12-yard line. Then Tom Matty, on the age-old Statue of Liberty play, moved the ball further upfield. With a little space between he and his own goal, Morrow tried the home run ball to Willie Richardson, streaking down the right sideline. It was incomplete, but Ursel McBee was socked with the dreaded pass interference penalty that gave the Colts a first down and all but put the game out of Minnesota's reach. Here, for your viewing pleasure, we present a portrait of a man in anger. Number 59 is Lonnie Warwick, middle linebacker, before he could get the ball off. And then he tripped over his own fallen blocker to end any threat. Baltimore took over and Timmy Brown personally ran out the clock. It was an important win for the Colts who retained their lead in the Coastal Division and brought their record to 10 and one. Minnesota's loss shaved its lead to the narrowest of margins. One half game over the still dangerous Green Bay Packers. The Vikings entered the game with the reputation for chewing up passers, but it was the Baltimore defensive line with its balance of youth and experience that in the end made the difference. Minnesota coach Bud Grant has said, you can tell the worth of a team by the way it reacts when it falls two touchdowns behind. It must continue to play its game. Unfortunately for Grant, Messrs. Bracey, Miller, and the two Smiths went right on playing their game also. Number 82, Raymond Berry, was honored as the Colts clobbered the Falcons, tying a record with their third shutout of the year. If they could next beat the Packers and the Bears could upset the Rams, Baltimore would be division champion. It was December 7th in Green Bay, and on a most impressive but frost-bitten Veterans Day at Lambeau Field, Coach Don Shula would have to find enough heroes to beat the Packers in their own icebox. Willie Richardson was cold, but Willie was a hero as he beat Herb Adderley for the only touchdown of the game. But the game was really won down in the dirt by the defense. defense forced five turnovers, setting up every score but one, and more than that, physically beat the once proud Packers so badly that the 16-3 score concealed the true margin of the Packers' defeat. In the last seven games, the Colts had allowed but two touchdowns, an incredible record that was finally rewarded when on the following day, the Bears upset the Rams and Baltimore was Coastal Division champion. It was Pride and Patriotism Day in Green Bay, Wisconsin. There are few cities as proud and as patriotic as Green Bay. Also, there are few cities as cold as Green Bay. For pass receivers like number 87, Baltimore coat Willie Richardson, frostbitten fingers are an affliction to be avoided any way possible. Perhaps Willie recalled the misadventures of Bob Hayes in the chilling 1967 championship game. Even receivers as accomplished as all pros like Hayes and Richardson have recurring winter nightmares about trying to catch passes in Green Bay. But Earl Morrow leads the league in passing and in winning games because of the footballs which are caught. John Mackey's receiving set up a Colt field goal. Morrow set up another three points by faking a square out pass and then throwing 36 yards downfield to wide open second year man Ray Perkins.
Three times, grizzled veteran Lou Michaels supplied the three-point play. Mike Mercer supplied a 45-yard Packer field goal in the first quarter. Holding for Mercer was as close as banged-up Bart Starr came to action all day. Only once all day did anyone cross the goal line. Five minutes into the game, before his fingers became stiff, Morrill called on Richardson to go deep against Herb Adderley. The throw was perfect, and so was the catch. And Baltimore had an early lead they would never give up. But as has become the custom, most of the action was supplied by the Colts' league-leading defense, led by veterans like number 76, Fred Miller, and number 81, Ordell Bracey. Crafty 13-year veteran Zeke Bratkowski had an almost impossible task in trying to outfox the crafty and mean Baltimore front line. Billy Ray Smith and his companions are just too tough to keep away for long. Sometimes discretion is definitely the better part of valor. Sometimes there is just no place to hide. Sometimes Bratkowski seemed to have the upper hand, but then his receiver fell down and 11-year veteran Lenny Lyles received instead. The cold defense also forced five fumbles. They allowed only nine first downs. But on the first play of the fourth quarter, the game started to turn. The Colts were on the Packer 12-yard line as Marl dropped back to pass for the touchdown. Willie Davis made contact. Lionel Aldridge took the ball as far as Terry Cole and Earl Marl would let him. Bratkowski dropped back to pass. Dennis Gorbats got a hand on the pass, but the ball fluttered straight to Claudus James for Green Bay's only gain of more than 20 yards. Three times in the period, the Packers drove, once to the Colts' seven-yard line. Three times, the Packers were stopped by the defense, which has yielded only two touchdowns in its last seven games. The Packers' fifth fumble of the day. Football's longest reigning dynasty had ended. Their first losing season since exactly 10 years ago. That was the year before Vince Lombardi came to Camelot. For the time being, the days of Camelot are over. The king has been dethroned. Long live the king. Baltimore Colts closed out a fantastic season on Sunday against the Rams. And once again, it was the bruising and relentless Colt defense that set the stage for victory. Early in the game, Ram quarterback Roman Gabriel hit Jack Snow with a 47-yard pass. Then he found Snow again, and this time he was wide open as he hauled in the 19-yard touchdown. The Rams were driving for another score when Gabriel threw this hurried pass. Mike Curtis intercepted and returned the ball 38 yards to knock the score at seven apiece. The Colts struck again in the first quarter as Earl Marl performed his now expected miracles with a 61-yard touchdown pass to Preston Pearson. This put the Colts in front 14-7.
the Rams came right back in the second quarter. Gabriel scrambled until Dick Bass could slip out of the backfield. Then he hit the scrappy back for a 21-yard pickup. Willie Ellison dove over from the two-yard line to make it 14-14. A good example of the rugged defensive play all day was this attempted punt. The Rams got another scoring chance at the end of the half, but Rick Volk crashed through and blocked Bruce Gossett's attempted field goal. The same thing happened again in the third quarter. This time, Billy Ray Smith broke through and blocked Gossett's kick. Something else happened in the third quarter. Johnny Unitas came in at quarterback and showed some of his old tricks. This juggling catch by Tom Matty set up a Baltimore score. On the first play of the fourth quarter, Unitas found Preston Pearson with a short toss that put the Colts back on top, 21-14. But Willie Ellison quickly erased the lead. 52 of his 111 rushing yards came from this burst through the left side. This tied it up at 21 all. The touchdown seemed to inspire the Ram defense. Unitas had to scramble and his run resulted in a costly fumble. Myron Patios recovered and Bruce Gossett finally got off a field goal. It was good for 21 yards and gave the Rams a 24-21 lead. But John Unitas coolly stepped in and turned the game around. This 37-yard pinpoint pass to Willie Richardson set up the winning score. Tom Matty slipped over from the four and the Colts ended up on top 28-24. With this victory, Baltimore tied a 1963 Chicago Bears record for least amount of points yielded by the defense and ended up with a booming 13-1 record. More importantly, though, the win put them in a good frame of mind to start their push for the Super Bowl. A month ago, Baltimore had defeated the Vikings with an aggressive rush and a goal line stand that stopped Bill Brown twice from the one to ensure a 21-9 victory. Today, on a wet and cold Sunday afternoon, the defense would probably again be the key to the game's outcome. And in a scoreless first quarter, it was the Viking defense that stood out. But the Colts would be the first to score. A great catch by Richardson and a moral to Mitchell touchdown had made it 7 0 at halftime. The game was won in the third quarter. Come on, baby, let's go! First, John Mackey ran away from two defenders for a 50-yard touchdown. But the defense would apply the clincher on the very next series of downs, as a vocal and emotional Tom Matty gave them their inspiration. Come on, Chitty, get him going! What do you say? Big play, baby, come on!
Trailing 21 nothing now, the Vikings were down, but not out. Come on, Bo, get after it, baby! Come on, run it! Their last chance was to keep a drive going with fourth and six on the cold 20. Come on, defense! It failed. Joe Kapp and the Vikings had been left in the mud of Memorial Stadium. The Vikings did score two touchdowns, but they came hopelessly late, and all that was left was to run out the clock. Run it out! Baltimore had done it. They were the Western Conference champions for the first time in four years and would now face the Browns in Cleveland for the NFL title. It seemed that one break for either team might make the difference. And early in the quarter, Cap threw his first interception, which Jerry Logan picked up and carried to the 28. There had been only one noticeable advantage for the Colts' offensive unit until now, and this was the combination of Marl to Richardson. Willie was being covered quite loosely by Ersel McBee, and when he had time to throw, Marl had found him wide open. But it took one of the great catches of the year by Richardson to really shake the Vikings for the first time. Two plays later, using two tight ends, Marl hit one of them, Tom Mitchell, an AFL cast-off, for the first score of the game. Late in the half, it was the Colts seven, the Vikings nothing. Cap, like Marl, was under extreme pressure from the defense and it helped cause him to throw his second interception, which number 40, Bobby Boyd, returned to the 33. Morrow was not content to run out the clock, and behind protection that was improving steadily, he spiraled a pass to split end Jimmy Orr for his first catch of the game to the Vikings 45. Of course, the best pass defense is a strong pass rush. And Fred Miller got to cap and gently laid him down for the first time in the game. In the first half, Willie Richardson was Marl's main target. Now it was tight end John Mackey, a devastating receiver and runner once he has the ball. Mackey had been beating his man over the middle. So Marl called the same play again on the next series and this time, Mackey went all the way on a thundering 50-yard catch and run, which made it 14 to nothing midway through the quarter. Mackey had rarely been used in the first half, and it was this adjustment by coach Don Shula at halftime that played one of the key roles in the game. Coming hard from the blind side, Bubba Smith and Ordell Bracey jarred the ball from Cap's arm. A blitzing Mike Curtis caught it on the fly, and the former fullback rumbled 60 yards for the Colts' second touchdown in less than two minutes. Of course, this was the big play, the play which completely shocked and demoralized the toughened Vikings, who, though 21 points behind, were still hanging in there, but now only by their thumbs. And on a third and eight, Baltimore made its first costly mistake of the game when Lenny Lyles interfered with Tom Hall on a bomb. And it was first and 10 on the one. Off of a play action fake, Cap hit Billy Martin alone in the end zone. And it was 21-7 midway through the quarter. The Colts then added an insurance field goal with a key play coming on a 16-yard pass to Willie Richardson, who had six receptions on the day 
for 150 yards. The field goal put Baltimore up by 17, and with three minutes to play, the contest was virtually over. Their short history. They had not been out-hustled or out-muscled. They had merely been outclassed by a team that had outclassed their opponents on 13 other Sundays in 1968. That is all but one. And ironically, it was that one, the Cleveland Browns, who would now meet Baltimore for the NFL championship. This was to be a rematch of the 1964 championship, which was won by Cleveland. But this year's Colts are a team of destiny. They are hoping that the parallels of 1964 and 1968 will come to an end next Sunday. To the Colts, the NFL championship was mostly a matter of revenge. Not only had the Browns shut out Baltimore in the 64 championship, but earlier this year dealt them their only loss, 30-20. They did it on the running of the great Leroy Kelly and the unfortunate bounce of the ball as three costly deflected interceptions resulted in the Colts' first defeat. Today would be different. Today, December 29th, 80,000 watched in a chilled silence as Don Shula coached, Earl Morrow called, and the defense played what was later termed the perfect game. Kelly and the Browns' running attack were methodically reduced to sawdust by a Colt defense that held him to 28 yards. Their passing attack was effectively shackled by a front line that buried Nelson and Ryan four times and pressured them into two costly interceptions, which, along with a fumble and a blocked field goal, were the keys to Baltimore's easy victory. On offense, Morrow threw sparingly but effectively, and Colt runners racked up 190 yards. Tom Maddy had his greatest game of the year, tying a championship record with three touchdowns. When it was all over, people had seen a display of flawless football, a tribute to a hungry and frustrated team that never forgot 1964, and to its coach. This was the arena, Cleveland's Municipal Stadium, December 29, 1968. For the 80,000 plus who attended, there were many signs that the 1968 championship game would be one of the most memorable in history. The last title game played here was between these same two teams, and Cleveland shut out the Colts 27-0. Like the Colts, this year, Cleveland had not been led by its first string quarterback, Frank Ryan, but by Bill Nelson, who led them to the Eastern Conference title. Cleveland also had a super runner, Leroy Kelly, who had been unstoppable in every game and was the key to their offense. Their defense was led by a strong young line and an old warrior past defender Erich Barnes. Barnes would guard this man, Willie Richardson, and his success or failure would be a key to the outcome of the game. Richardson would not be looking to John Unitas for his receptions, but to Earl Morrow, the NFL's most valuable player. But as the Colts warmed up, they had no idea that what was to occur would not be a memorable contest, but rather an execution. Things got off to a foreboding start for the Browns. Blue Michael's opening kickoff was mishandled by Ben Davis, then barely returned 10 yards before being rocked to the ground by one of the Colts bomb squad. What followed was a scoreless first quarter but one which set much of the tone for the entire game. The Colts had to contain Leroy Kelly to stop the Browns. And from the outset, it was clear that Kelly and the Browns' great offensive line was in for a long day. The Colts' defensive line and its quick linebackers had been almost invincible against the rush all year. But they saved their biggest effort for the biggest game of the season and stopped Kelly on almost every attempt from moving through the middle or around the end. Quarterback Bill Nelson was forced to throw early and often. When he did, Baltimore's secondary covered well. Colt defenders were helped by a strong pass rush, which pressured Nelson all day, and on four occasions smothered him for losses. The 
turning point of the game came on their first series, when they found that they could run and run well on the Browns' defense. And the man who did most of the legwork was number 41, Tom Matty, the all-purpose back that was to have one of his greatest days. soon after his running game was established, but the Colts' first drive ended with this interception by Ben Davis. Late in the quarter, however, Morrow's aerial game went into high gear. He mixed his targets well, calling first on number 28, Jimmy Orr, and then on his speedy flanker, Willie Richardson, number 87, who made his first catch of the game. ground game was the key to Baltimore's success today. And behind great blocking, Matty rolled downfield. On this play, watch number 45, fullback Jerry Hill, helped spring Matty for 12 more as the scoreless quarter ended. Now at the 21, Morrow went for Richardson on third down. But the ball was overthrown, and the Colts had to settle for a 27-yard field goal from strong-toed Lou Michaels. It was 3-0 Colts early in the second quarter. One of Morrill's pet plays is an end around to John Mackey, and it started the next scoring drive. Mackey is almost a personification of the Colts' invincibility and has been a major reason for their great success. So has veteran Jimmy Orr. Orr's sideline pattern put the ball on the Browns' 17. From the eight, watch center Bill Carey clear an alley for Jerry Hill, who went to the one. This is the kind of blocking Colt runners received all day. Matty bounced in for the score, and now midway through the quarter, it was 10-0 as Baltimore continued to gather momentum. On third and seven, Nelson went deep to tight end Morin. But all pro free safety Rick Volk made a great play, cutting in front of Morin at the last second. Baltimore's defense had made what seemed like another key break. Little effort to forget. On the very next play, Mike Curtis intercepted a wild throw by Nelson, and this time the Colts moved swiftly in for their third score of the quarter. Tom Matty was slowly piling up yards and honors. Here he added 12 to his mounting total. Then he ran through and around the Browns defense on a Leroy Kelly type run that ended in his second touchdown of the game. On the last play, watch the Colt line knife down potential tacklers as Matty showed everyone that he is far from the garbage runner some have labeled him. 
Seven Colts took a 17-point lead into the locker room. While Coach Collier must have felt much colder than he looked, the Colts already were feeling the warm sun of Miami Beach. Now only 30 minutes and a plane ride away. Third down and 22. Nelson is swarmed under and brought down by Ordell Bracey, number 81. Bracey fought off the block and still made the tackle. Down, and Timmy Brown is the single safety man as Cockroft does the punting. And a high kick carries to midfield, and Timmy Brown takes it at the Cleveland 48-yard line. We have 6-10 left in the third quarter. And Jerry Hill carries. Following a block by Matty, cuts inside and gets inside the 45-yard line. Together on the right side with Richardson out of your picture at the bottom. And the pass is caught by Mitchell, who just come into the game. And that's going to be a first down. The fake draw. Morrow throwing long for Richardson, battling Barnes. Barnes couldn't find it, and Richardson does. And it's first and goal from the five. Barnes couldn't find the football. They're thrown a little bit, and I think if it hadn't been underthrown, it probably would not have been complete. Barnes has him covered and has him covered well. And you can see the ball was thrown behind. Uh, Richardson stopped and came back, and here it's just couldn't stop soon enough. That's up Baltimore's field position right now. Matty scores for the third time today. Tom Matty, following Glenn Ressler and others, Sam Ball, Bill Curry, Dan Sullivan, scores for the third time today, making it 23. Baltimore 24, Cleveland nothing. We'll be back with the Colts kickoff in just a moment. 10 of 26 for 126 yards. So Ryan fumbles the ball and Sinek recovers. Ryan on the first play fumbled and Don Sinek recovered the football. Make a change like that. He missed the center snap. Just a simple mistake like that puts Baltimore in position again to get on the scoreboard as Ryan and Hoagland just simply missed the exchange. There's Ryan. Richardson's to the left side with Orr. And Morrow gives the ball to Hill. Hill inside the 10. Hill's at about the six-yard line, where it'll be first down and goal. Mackey splits to the outside, and Morrill throws for six to Mackey, and he's missed the ball. Jim Houston, the linebacker, was covering there, and the ball was nicely thrown by Morrill, but Mackey missed it, and now... And he makes it good. So the score amounts to 27 to nothing in favor of the Colts. Well, this was the score when Cleveland beat Baltimore in 1964. Ernie Green, by the way, is a good pass receiver. He's in the pattern. And Ryan is dumped. The whistle hasn't blown. Kelly picked up the football, and Boyd gets him from behind. And Kelly is down for a loss on the play. Ordell Bracey was the first man to hammer Frank Ryan. And Ryan looking downfield, looking first for Collins and looking then to go to the safety valve receiver. Now he didn't quite have possession of the ball as Bracey hit him in the back first. Kelly picks it up and probably wishes he didn't. He had Boyd, Bobby Boyd looking right at him. Third and ten. Green is the lone setback. Ryan is hit by Bracey once again. He wanted to throw, but Mike Curtis was covering the would-be receiver, who is Gary Collins. As much as they can without losing momentum. Matty picks up three and picks up additional yardage, and he bangs to the 45-yard line, and that's going to be a first down with Dale Lindsay making the final stop for Cleveland, and then Matty is having some kind of a running day. First down from the 45. Here's Morrow with the inside handoff to Hill, who gets five. Second and six. There's Timmy Brown, who replaced Matty, getting down to the Cleveland 46-yard line. Hill and Brown in the backfield. And the fake to Brown, third down, the pass to Richardson. He caught the ball. Barnes brings him down inside the 20-yard line who was wide open early, but Barnes made a great recovery to even get over close to him by the time he caught the ball. First down. Third and six. 
Morrow looks for Cole, who just come into the game. He caught the ball, and Bob Matheson hauled him down from behind. Record of the most in one game, three. Bobby Boyd spots the ball. Flags are down, and the ball hits the upright. Now let's see what the flag is all about. Here's the call. Offside and attempting to block the field goal. They have a shutout going here. That's Cole running with the ball inside the five-yard line to the four. Terry Cole. With Cole. Four and a half minutes remaining in the game. Timmy Brown into the end zone. Timmy Brown, who knows how to find pay dirt, even though he hasn't played much this year, danced in from four yards out. Wrestling. Curry is the center, number 50. Here comes wrestler 62 with a block on Walter Johnson. And Timmy Brown into the end zone. They're on their own 33 with a first down. Frank Ryan still in their quarterback, and he wings it out here, and it is almost picked off by Charlie Stukes, number 47, who would have picked up six more quick points. A third down play, third and eight from the Cleveland 35. Ryan needs eight yards, and the ball is batted up into the air by Hilton, number 85, and it's fourth down. Here comes Timmy Brown, cutting back inside, getting out beyond the 35-yard line. He gives the ball to Terry Cole. Cole crosses the 40-yard line, and Marvin Upshaw tackled him. Cleveland has all three of their timeouts remaining, but we don't know how anxious they'll be to stop the clock. The Baltimore Colts are the champions of the National Football League, and there is Don Schuller, the winning coach. One of his good friends, one of his best friends in the business, is Blanton Collier, a wonderful gentleman who is the head coach of the Cleveland Browns, and the two shake hands at midfield. The final score was 34 to nothing as Baltimore won it convincingly. Just as Cleveland left no doubt when they defeated Dallas a week ago Saturday, Baltimore leaves no doubt here today, Pat. Coach of the Year, Don Shula. What were Shula's thoughts on a most satisfying season? He must have thought about Miami and the game that spoiled an otherwise super year. He must have also thought, however, that despite being upset by the Jets, 15-2 was still the best record in both leagues. 60 minutes in Miami could not erase that fact.